Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second lecture of our lecture series about Josephus Flavius, the ancient Jewish historian whose historiographical works greatly contributed to the shaping of Jewish and Christian self-understanding, albeit not in the same level and in the same manner. So I'm Chavatior Samuelson. I'm the director of Jewish studies at ASU. I'm Regents Professor of History and Irving and Miriam Lowe Professor of Modern Judaism. Last week, may I assume most of you here with us tonight also were with us last week when Professor Francoise Mirguet introduced Josephus by providing us with uh, biographical information and situating him historically in the context of Jewish-Roman relations during the first century. Uh, Josephus illustrated, uh, and still does, I guess we can use it in the present tense, the depth of Jewish immersion in a non-Jewish culture. In his case, it was the Greco-Roman culture. And that was at least the case for the upper classes in Judea. But at the same time, as Francoise had taught us, uh, he had a very strong Jewish national pride uh, and really kind of made the case of Jews to non-Jews. Josephus indeed was a very complex character and he was uh, viewed very differently uh, by Jews and non-Jews and especially over time there was a shift in perception of Josephus. So tonight Dr. Daniel Steinkokin will shed light on his Jewish identity by looking at his interpretation or interpretations I should say of the Bible. Next Wednesday, exactly the same time as you know, uh, he will explore the reception of Josephus' literary legacy by Jews and by Christians over the centuries. So let me say a few words to introduce you to Dr. Daniel Stein Cocking. He's an intellect, he's a Jewish intellectual historian. Um, he works, he, he holds a PhD from Harvard University in Renaissance Intellectual and Cultural History. Uh, he has taught at Yale, at University of Oregon, at UCLA, at, and in Germany at the University of Greifswald. Uh, in all of those places, he taught a very wide array of courses uh, on Jewish studies or courses in Jewish studies, really from antiquity to the present. As an intellectual historian, he focuses especially on the Renaissance and the early modern period, he works on, uh, he's written and published on uh, Jewish humanism, on Hebraism in the Renaissance, on Jewish-Christian relations in the Middle Ages and the early modern periods, and on the transformation of Jewish literary and visual motifs over time. It is his ability to trace cultural development over centuries that makes his scholarship so distinctive and so interesting. Most recent, his most recent publication included an edited volume uh, under the title of Hebrew Between Jews and Christians that came out in 2022. And he has a very long study of uh, Benjamin of Tudela Book of Travels, which was published at the Hebrew Union College Annual, a very important scholarly publication here in the United States. For the past four years, Dr. Stein Cochin has been helping us in Jewish studies at ASU uh, by organizing conferences and public programs and participating in public programs. You may remember the wonderful uh, conference on Jews in Italian musical life from 1450 to the present. And if you have not had the chance to be with us at that event, you can look at it at, on the website of Jewish Studies. It was held in November 2022. And uh, he really was the person who enabled us to bring to ASU and to Phoenix a wonderful group of musicologists, of ethnomusicologists, of Judaica scholars and musicians from Italy, from Israel and from the United States. It was a marvelous event. He also, in uh, May 2022, he organized another public program at uh, Beth El uh, Synagogue in Phoenix that focused on the musical traditions of Bukharan Jews. And that was also a remarkable program which was attended by uh, really literally hundreds of people. It was quite beautiful. Um, and in two weeks, actually less than two weeks, it's really more like uh, 10 days, there's going to be a program about klezmer music, Jewish klezmer music in the Ukraine. And you can get more information about it. That's going to uh, be held on Sunday, the 28th of January at seven o'clock at Bethel. 
and more information will be coming out by Jewish studies, but you can also go to the website of BethelPhoenix.com and see more information. Well, tonight he's not going to talk to us about music. He's going to focus on biblical exegesis by Josephus. And uh, that will remind us that Josephus was a priest, something that kind of got lost maybe a little bit when we talked about Josephus last week. So he was a priest, he was a military leader, as well as a historian. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Stein Cocking with us this evening. Uh, we are all going, I'm going to turn off my camera and my audio. I remind you to put your questions, if you don't mind, in the Q&A rather than in the chat. That makes it a little bit easier to respond to everything in one place rather than to move from two different locations on the screen. So, uh, Daniel, the screen is yours. We are here to study from you and with you. All right, well, thank you so much, Professor Tiro Samuelson, uh, Chava, for the very kind and detailed introduction. Thank you as well for the invitation to participate in this series. Thank you to Lisa for all of your coordination. Thanks to Francoise, to Professor Mirguet for, uh, for collaborating with me on it and starting us off so wonderfully last week. And thanks to all those in attendance. It's really great to see that even in 5784 slash 2024, Josephus is still the rock star that he deserves to be. And for more on stars, uh, stay tuned or perhaps better stay zoomed for next week's talk. Won't say anything else about that. You have to come back. All right, so just a word on how I come to Josephus. As you heard, I really spend most of my time in the Middle Ages and the early modern period and the Renaissance period. And so I sort of come to Josephus in a way backwards because I find that for all, for so many of the topics that interest me, the biblical heritage and its afterlives, the destruction of the temple by the Romans uh, in Jerusalem in 70 CE and its consequences and the memory of it, the Jew and Jewish engagement with and response to Rome. For all these subjects, all these subjects continue, keep bringing me back to Josephus. And, and I've worked on the reception of Josephus's writings, but over time doing that also led me to become increasingly interested in Josephus for his own sake and in Josephus's writings in his own sake. And that's why I'm so glad to have the opportunity to participate in this in this lecture series, because it gives me an opportunity to do to really focus on, on Josephus uh, and less on what others have done with him, although we'll come to that next week. Oh. So, and what I want to say at this juncture is that in a sense, what really I find most fascinating about Josephus, and we this came up in Chava's introductions, it was addressed last week, but I'll bring it up again, especially for those who are perhaps maybe joining us uh, this week for the first time, is really Josephus's hybrid character. As a Jew, indeed a Jerusalemite who became a Roman, his Flavian patrons granted him Roman citizenship. And he of course became a Roman precisely because of and at the precise time in which Rome subdued Judea and destroyed Jerusalem. And that means, interestingly, I think that his life is pretty much evenly divided between its Jerusalem and Rome segments. So Josephus was born in around 37 CE. In around 70 CE at age 33 or so, he comes to Rome. And then he lives there for another 30 years or so until his death around 100 CE. Perhaps it was becoming a Roman and living in Rome that rendered it so critical for Josephus to engage uh, with what it means to be a Jew. And certainly that task became his life's work in his major writings, the Jewish war, Jewish antiquities, and against uh, Apion. And of course, in exploring what it means to be a Jew, he wrote in Greek and engaged deeply with how Greeks wrote about themselves and others. Now, there's much discussion in the literature uh, concerning the Jewish antiquities and against Appian, and we'll say more about these two works in just a few moments. Uh, were they directed primarily for non-Jews? Were they perhaps directed primarily for Jews? And the, the opinion among scholars really runs that full gamut. I'll just make a few observations here on this question. He refers to a patron in both of those works, a man by the name of, of, of uh, Epaphroditus, who seems to be non-Jewish, at least most of the scholarly literature that deals with him seems to regard him as being non-Jewish. And at the outset of the Jewish antiquities, let's see, uh, there he, he notes, he writes, and now I've undertaken this present work uh, uh, in the belief, sorry, I'm having a little trouble seeing something here, in the belief that the whole Greek speaking world Literally all the Greeks, I see something else again. And now I've undertaken this present work in the belief that the whole Greek speaking world, 
literally all the Greeks will find it worthy of attention. Uh, for it will embrace our entire ancient history and political constitution, the Torah, the laws of the Torah, translated from the Hebrew records. So it's clear to me, uh, well, when he refer refers to the whole Greek-speaking world, is he referring just to ethnic Greeks? Or by emphasizing the whole Greek-speaking world, all the Greeks, is he referring, does he mean to include also those Jews who spoke Greek, who were quite substantial in number at this time. In any case, it's clear to me that Josephus has both audiences in mind. And I hope at the close of today's talk, we'll come to an explicit indication uh, that he really does in fact have, have, Jewish, have a Jewish audience in mind. But it's nonetheless noteworthy that Josephus, so far as I'm aware, never explicitly addresses Jewish readers. He adopts the rhetorical posture of writing to non to the non-Jewish world, at least in most cases, and perhaps that's valuable in and of itself. Uh, puts forward the notion that his text is viable on the world stage. Insofar as he is, though, writing for Jews, he's writing to instill confidence uh, in their culture, in their traditions, in an age of catastrophe, in the aftermath of the Great Revolt that led to such destruction in Judea, and he's writing to Greeks and Romans to instill respect for Judaism and Jews at a time in which it was easy and common for them to be mocked or criticized, but also at a time in which it was clear that many were really quite interested uh, in, in Jews and uh, Judaism. Uh, to go back to his patron, the man uh, uh, Epaphroditus, he, Josephus refers to his great interest in, in, in the subject matter. Uh, so again, an indication. Uh, but we could perhaps also say that the degree to which Judaism comes under attack by writers in, jo in Josephus's age uh, re reflects also the degree to which for these writers, it represented actually something of a real threat due to its uh, popularity. So I just wanna draw our attention to two quick sources, which admittedly come admittedly comes from slightly after the time that Josephus was writing, but nonetheless, I think do capture nicely the the general intellectual and cultural atmosphere in which Josephus was active. So the first is from Tacitus, uh, the great Roman historian, who in a in a in a in a long section in which he addresses the history, the origins of the Jews uh, and 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 their and their their culture, he refers to Moses introducing new religious practices, quite opposed to those of all other religions. The Jews regard as profane all that we hold sacred. On the other hand, they permit all that we abhor. And then if we turn to the great uh, Silver Age Roman poet or satirist Juvenal, he has this fascinating passage in which he refers to a father, to people who have a father who reveres the Sabbath and uh, the, worship the divinity of the heavens and see no difference between eating swine's flesh or that of human beings. In other words, they keep some degree of kashrut and in time may even take to circumcision. Having been wont to flout the laws of Rome, they learn and practice and revere the Jewish law and all that Moses handed down in his secret tome. So the passage is quite critical, but it seems to reflect quite an extensive degree of interest in Jewish life and Jewish practices in early, in late first century, early second century Rome. Uh, and so uh, as Josephus sought to explain Judaism to Gentiles, he in, he wanted to respond to the mockery, to the misconceptions, to the critiques that he encountered, but he also had evidence, I think, uh, all around him, I think, that it was actually that it was actually possible to address those misconceptions, critiques, and mockery, precisely because there was such a large degree, high degree of fascination uh, concerning Jews and Judaism. Now, much of Josephus's writing is concerned with the Jewish past, and it's going to be our task this evening to investigate how he went about treating and indeed rewriting aspects of the Jewish past. First of all, we should ask though, why did he devote so much attention to Jewish history and to ancient Jewish history? A lot of this has to do with the fact that uh, the stature of a culture depended on the degree of its antiquity and the character of its antiquity. And I think Josephus felt deeply that in order to defend the honor or the viability of the Jewish present and to ensure a Jewish future, he needed to revisit and retell the, G, the, the deep Jewish past. Okay, so in, a, in, in addressing this issue this evening, there are two main things that I wanna, that I wanna focus on. One, I wanna show how 
he advocated for the very uniqueness, superiority, and value of Moses and the laws that he passed down. And two, I want to show how Josephus went about to defend the consistency, the reliability, the consistency and reliability of the Bible as a document worthy of respect. We're going to tackle each of those admittedly related issues separately. And in each case, I'll first underscore my sense of, of the specific problem that Josephus wanted to address, or at least one of the specific problems that Josephus felt he needed to address. And then we'll, we'll show how he did so uh, through a case study, through focusing on a passage or on a series of passages, um, which I hope will showcase Josephus's modus operandi in addressing these challenges. We'll primarily focus on the Jewish antiquities, uh, by far his longest work, and more on that in a little bit, because I actually would like to begin here with the slightly later and much smaller Against Apio, which dates from around 97, just so just a few years prior to Josephus's death. And the work Against Apion is also sometimes referred to as On the Antiquity of the Jews. It's composed of two books, and it opens with Josephus's complaint that despite or indeed in response to his Jewish antiquities, there are a lot of people out there who don't really believe in the antiquity, don't trust the antiquity of the Jews as a people. And uh, Daniel, uh, yes. we don't see anything on the screen. Have you turned off your shared screen? No, no, no. This is this is a blank. It's a blank slide. It's a blank slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I promise. See, there's there's more coming shortly. Stay okay. Soon. Good. Stay zoomed. Okay. So he uh, Josephus, Josephus wants to ensure, wants to show that the Jews, in fact, do have. Uh, in antiquity, that they're in fact older than, than, say, the Greeks and their civilization. And he does so by referring to Greek writers who do, in fact, refer to the Jews uh, as proof that the Jews, you know, they've been there, they've been out there, they have, they have a history. And along the way, he wants to refute the various calumnies or misconceptions that these writers bring to bear. From our perspective today, the great value of this work, one of the great values of this work, is that it preserves all kinds of fascinating material that otherwise would have been lost to us. But I want to focus in this work on a particular passage that casts wonderful light, I think, on the subtlety and sophistication with which Josephus tries to carve out a legitimate place for Judaism in the Greco-Roman world. But first, I need to clarify the specific nature of the challenge that, uh, that Josephus faced. So the specific problem here is that for many of the Greeks and for many of the Romans, just they didn't really, they weren't, they didn't take seriously Moses and, and the Torah. And specifically, there was a tendency uh, in Greek and Roman culture to really reinterpret, uh, in the, we're talking about elite culture here, to reinterpret lawgivers, basically to see Moses in the rubric of all the ancient lawgivers, all of whom basically had the practice of referring their respective legislation to a particular divinity in order to enhance its authority with their respective publics. Uh, and this, actually, I'm going to jump to this slide. This is what I like to refer to as the ascription trope. I'll read, I'll, I'll describe it just one more time so we're clear. The claim widespread in Hellenistic and Roman culture that lawgivers ascribe their legislation to deities in order to enhance its authority and reception among their respective peoples. Now, we encountered this idea in lots of ancient authors, Greek and also Latin, but I will just draw our attention to one. This is from Diodorus Siculus, or Diodorus of Sicily, an important uh, ancient historian who wrote in the first century BCE. And in the passage that you see here from his library of history, which is a mammoth sort of compendium of different historians that attempts to treat uh, really all of world history up to his time. He basically goes through a series of figures who, who, who basically did this, lawgivers who claimed that their legislation was received from a particular god. Uh, and at the very bottom of his list is a kind of afterthought. He notes, yeah, among the Jews also, Moses referred his laws to this god who they call Yao. Uh, that's his rendition of, of the Jewish God. And then he goes on to say, there are basically two reasons why lawgivers do this sort of thing. Either because they think that uh, their laws are good and that basically they're sort of, because they're so good, they have a kind of almost divine character. Or he says that, uh, and this is 
perhaps what he more likely thinks, that the common crowd is going to is more likely to obey the law if they think that this law actually comes from some, you know, from some God as opposed to from some man. So this is the sort of context in which Josephus comes in. He's writing, you know, to to Greeks and Romans, also to Jews, but to Greeks and Romans, and he wants to make a case for why Moses and his law should really be taken seriously and not just dismissed and treated as just yet another, you know, example of you know what all ancient lawgivers, you know, have done. So now we come to his passage in Against Appian, where I think he really tries to take on the ascription trope, again, as I like to call it, head up. And the context here is basically Moses has just described how, sorry, not Moses, Josephus, has just described how Moses has basically led the Israelites out of Egypt from slavery, and now basically uh, he and grants them and then brings them these laws. And now I'll read the source. With such noble aspirations and such a record of successful achievements, Moses had good reason for thinking that he had God for his guide and counsel. Having first persuaded himself that God's will governed all his actions and all his thoughts, he regarded it as his primary duty to impress that idea upon the community. For to those who believe that their lives are under the eye of God, all sin is intolerable. Now, I find this passage, and this is actually the first part, uh, but I find this passage remarkable for a number of reasons, and then we'll come to the second part. So, first of all, he doesn't actually set out by saying that Moses had God for his guided counsel. He says that based on Moses' record, based on Moses' goals, he had good reason for thinking that he had God for his guide and counsel. Having first persuaded himself that God's will governed all his actions, he doesn't say that God's will necessarily governed all his actions, but he says that Moses persuaded himself that this was the case, and that led him to regard it as his primary duty to, to share that idea with upon the community. Uh, not just because he wanted to give laws to the community, but because he wanted, he wanted uh, his people to have the same conception, to have the same idea that they were basically under the eye of God, that God was watching and paying close attention to their actions. Whether it's true or not, it actually sort of enhances one's moral behavior uh, because someone who thinks that God, uh, that their actions are under the eye of God, whether they are in fact or not, uh, will regard all sin as intolerable. So again, what I find remarkable in this passage is without insisting outright on what, you know, what Jews traditionally believe, uh, he rather restates, he, he reframes those beliefs in a subtle manner, one that is in a sense reconcilable with the ascription trope, but nonetheless casts Moses in a very special, very particular light. And this becomes even more clear in the sequel, in the continuation. Such was our legislator. No charlatan or imposter, as slanders unjustly call him, you know, claiming that he basically faked uh, all this, you know, the stuff that he claims, you know, happened in the Torah, but really one such as the Greeks boast of having had in Mos in Minos and later legislators. And then he goes on to say, yeah, so, you know, different lawgivers ascribe their laws to different people, as I've already indicated was often the case. But the question, who was the most successful legislator and who attained to the truest conception of God may be answered by contrasting the laws themselves with those of others. And to these, I must now turn. So again, here he just, he basically says, all right, you know, Moses is in a sense similar, is the kind of person that uh, the Greeks claim that, you know, Greek law, the Greeks, you know, claim, claim that they had for lawgivers. But of course, instead of Moses being a mere afterthought, as in the case of Diodorus Siculus, in Josephus's presentation, Moses is the, is actually the model of a lawgiver. And in the case of these other lawgivers that he mentions, you know, they either believe that it's true that they uh, got their laws from a god, or they hope in this way to facilitate their acceptance. That's the classic notion, as I already as I already indicated. But it falls short of what he said about Moses. That Moses actually had had come to take on this belief himself, and actually felt that it would be extremely important from a moral perspective for his people to share this view as well. And you'll notice that in contrast to the Greek sources like Diodorus and others, that basically just in a kind of sociological manner just placed these lawgivers alongside one another as all functionally equal, 
Josephus is actually concerned with, well, who actually attained to the truest conception of God, who actually, whose laws were in fact the most successful. Uh, again, he doesn't say that Moses received God's revelation directly. He's actually more interested in who attained to the truest conception of God. I think it's really quite a remarkable approach uh, to response to the group to the challenge posed by Greco-Roman culture. And I think actually even even today theologically has something to has something to commend it. Okay. So having addressed uh, having addressed that issue, I want to now turn to the second uh, topic and this will take us to the to the Jewish antiquities, the question of how Josephus went about retelling or revisiting uh, Jewish scriptures and validating them as a reliable, consistent, uh, dependable document. Again, this is a blank slide. Now, Francoise last week noted that Josephus's life, his autobiography, is likely the earliest such text that we have in the Western tradition. This is a fascinating detail and also relevant for, for my presentation for in his book entitled The Jewish or Ju Judean, as it's sometimes translated, Antiquities, Josephus also did something unprecedented. He set out comprehensively to retell the entire Bible. Indeed, Josephus has rightly been described as the earliest systematic commentator on the Bible. And apropos the life, it actually seems that Josephus deemed the life as fully itself a part of the, of the antiquities. Now, this work is a massive text accompanying 20 discrete books, and it covers the period from the creation of the world virtually down to Josephus's own time. In its size, 20 books, and in its name, it seems quite clear that Josephus was modeling his work after the Roman antiquities of the Greek historian Dionysus of Halicarnassus, who similarly lived in Rome, albeit in the late first century and early fir first century BC and early first century CE, so a few generations prior to Josephus. In some respects, the works are very similar. Dionysus praises Rome, uh, Josephus praises the Jews. Both appeal to their audiences to drop prejudice, prejudices that they might have regarding the subject group. But whereas Dionysus is trying to persuade the Greeks to accept the Romans because he presents them as actually being ultimately themselves Greek, Josephus is concerned in the antiquities to emphasize the uniqueness of the Jews. And what Josephus is in essence doing in the Jewish antiquities is an in instance of what uh, the famous uh, biblical scholar, scholar of ancient Judaism and early Christianity, Geza Vermes, termed rewritten Bible. And this is uh, a concept that, uh, I mean, the, the various interpretations of it, but I want to focus on a few, uh, few aspects of it that I think are helpful for thinking about Josephus's Jewish antiquities. So one, the notion that it, is concerned with an interpretive process by which a base text is rewritten. In other words, what are the motivations that lead to the retelling? So in a moment, we're going to consider how Josephus retells certain aspects of scripture. So what are the motives for that retelling? And then to turn to another scholar who's dealt, dabbled in, dealt with this concept of rewritten Bible, Anders Klostergaard Peterson, uh, he describes he describes rewritten Bible as this, as texts that borrow authority from scriptural predecessors by rewriting them. In other words, these rewritten texts lay claim to the authority of scripture. So in the case of Josephus, this leads us again to ask what motivates him to retell scripture as he does, and what kinds of claims does he make for his composition? All right, well, first, in order to understand his motivations, let's look at the challenges that he faced. And for this, I want to turn to really the, the doyen of Josephus scholarship in the 20th century, the late uh, Louis Feldman, legendary Yeshiva University professor, who noted that one of the recurring charges uh, against the Jews is that the Bible lacks historic historicity. You can't really, you can't really trust it. Uh, and another charge that Louis Feldman notes is that uh, against the, the against the Bible was that the, was the contention that they contained that the scriptures contained contradictions and discrepancies in chronology, so the lack of historicity it didn't really stuff hadn't really happened 
and you couldn't really trust the text because there were all kinds of contradictions and discrepancies uh, in the text. Josephus himself notes uh, uh, in the course of the antiquities, he admits that our one innovation has been to classify the several subjects that come up. Uh, for Moses left what he wrote in a scattered sporadic, the origin of our root sporadic uh, condition, just as he received each several instruction from God. I have thought it necessary to make this preliminary observation, lest perchance any of my countrymen who read this work should reproach me at all for having gone astray. Here's one case where he does, in fact, refer to uh, a Jewish audience. Uh, so he's, Josephus here is specifically referring to the laws that Moses uh, presents in the Torah. But I think the fact that he admits this in this case, it suggests to us, makes us aware of the fact that Josephus was certainly sensitive to various other problems, uh, other inconsistencies or organizational problems uh, that one encounters when one reads the Bible through from, from start to finish. And that if he was gonna retell the whole thing, he would in some way need to uh, address. Otherwise, he also, on a few occasions, makes the claim, I am only translating the books of the Hebrews into the Greek tongue, promising to report their contents without adding anything of my own to the narrative or omitting anything therefrom. All right, well, that isn't exactly what he does, uh, I think it's fair to say. But I would suggest that Josephus, in these last two patches, passages that we've looked at, both provides justifications for the discrepancies that are there between his work and scripture itself, while at the same time arrogating to his opus at least some of the original authority of the Bible. So, so in other words, I think he makes a case for the value in retelling scripture to clean up its chronological, thematic messiness and so forth. And what I wanna do in most of my remaining time is to show how he goes about doing this by focusing on the specific theme of the tribes of Israel. So why this topic? First of all, I think it has something fresh about it. There's lots of work out there on Josephus's retelling of the Bible, and I specifically recommend for those who are interested, here I have it, the 600 some odd pages of Louis Feldman's Josephus's, re Josephus's interpretation of the Bible, which has wonderful chapters devoted to various biblical figures in which Feldman really goes through the entirety of Josephus's treatment and explains how it, you know, what he does. But there are many other uh, scholars out there who have who have looked at other aspects of Josephus's retelling. But I don't, I'm not sure. I don't sense that the tribes themselves have been have been treated so systematically. Secondly, I think a good case can be made for the importance of the theme, because the tribes as a theme, as a topic, extend really across all of the Hebrew Bible from Genesis. Uh, where they where they begin to the final book of the Bible Chronicles, it's uh, I think a very good test case for assessing Josephus's uh, the systematic uh, or uh, character or consistency of Josephus's retelling, and furthermore, uh, as the constituent parts of the people of Israel, the tribes reflect not only upon the consistency and reliability of Scripture, but also upon the status of the intactness and viability of the people of Israel as a whole. So I think the way that Josephus deals with the tribes reflects what he's trying to do vis-a-vis, -vis, say, especially his fellow Jews in, in showing the viability, continuity, and prospects for the future of, of the Jewish people. And I just want to make clear that in, in discussing, as I'm about to do, how Josephus tries to clear up some of the tensions, messiness, uh, contradictions, I'm not saying that he necessarily resolves the problems fully. I think what it's more the case that he appreciates that there are problems in scripture and he's trying to package them effectively, both for his pagan readership and for his Jewish re readership. But before we can delve into this more deeply, let's just review what we're talking about when we talk about the tribes uh, at all. So uh, obviously we're dealing with the 12 sons of Jacob, which led to the idea of 12 tribes. This is all emerges in the book of Genesis. Of course, though, life is complicated. So Joseph, uh, Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, is not actually a tribe, but rather himself father to two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So actually, we end up with 13 tribes, except that the tribe of Levi does not actually inherit land, 
but rather lives amid, scattered amongst the other 12 tribes. So we're back down to 12 tribes. We talk about the tribes who actually inherited territory in the promised land, and that's what you see before you, a map of those tribal allotments. With the division of the kingdom after the death of Solomon, we typically talk about 10 tribes in the larger northern kingdom of Israel and two tribes in the smaller southern kingdom of Judah. And then with the Assyrian destruction of Israel in seven of the northern kingdom in 722 BC, we talk about the exile of the 10 tribes, which leads to the vast legend series of legends concerning the 10 lost tribes. Uh, with regard to the southern kingdom, Judah, that endures until it falls to the Babylonians in 587 or 586 BCE. But as you may have heard, life is complicated uh, because if we look at the map of tribal allotments, we see that actually there are three tribes in the south. You have Benjamin, sort of in the middle there, Judah, and then further to the south, Simeon. That means that there are actually only 11 tribes in the north, uh, sorry, 11 tribes in total, nine in the north, two in the south, unless we count Benjamin as a northern tribe. And as we'll see in just a moment, the Bible itself seems somewhat conflicted on this point. So you might ask, what does this all matter? Uh, and I think my, my answer would be that we see in Josephus' time in a number, in numerous texts, just how important it was for authors to be able to show or to pretend to show that the Jewish nation remains complete. It remains whole. One great example of this just briefly. In the letter of Aristeus, which is a text that purports to showcase, to account for the translation of, of the Torah into Greek, uh, according to the letter of Aristeus, there were 72 people, six from each of the 12 tribes, who were responsible for the translation of scripture from Hebrew into Greek. So the fact that all the tribes of the people were represented in this massive undertaking, in a way, granted the translation a degree of authority. If we turn actually to New Testament texts, we see, uh, I'm not going to linger on this, but we see a number of places in the New Testament that, that simply take for granted that the 12 tribes are all still out there. The people still remains whole in some form. Um, And indeed, the very fact that there are 12 apostles, I think, is modeled on the notion that that you need sort of 12, uh, you, the, 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 the importance of the number 12 for us, for connoting uh, wholeness. Uh, and so the notion that there's a new important revelation for or change for the Jewish story, you sort of in a way need 12 tribes out there in order to authorize and publicize that important transition from the perspective of the Christian authors. All right, so there are two examples. Uh, and we'll, we'll see in a moment how, well, what I want to say is, while these, those texts, Letter of Aristeus, the various New Testament texts, simply assume that the 12 tribes are still out there in some form, Josephus actually sets about addressing problematic passages in scripture in order to advance the argument that one really can not take seriously the fact that they are still out there. And I think that's actually a really important contribution of him. I think he really is the first to really actually try to try to go through all these sources and to systematize this issue and really creates, is responsible for the notion that we have today, that there were 10 tribes in the north and two tribes in the south. At your leisure, I won't dwell on it here, take a look at Deuteronomy 33, Moses' parting blessing to the Israelite tribes. You'll note there that, that the tribe of Simon or Simeon is missing. In his recapitulation of this episode, Josephus refers simply to Moses foretelling what would befall each of their tribes afterward with the addition of a blessing to them. So in other words, Josephus simply leaves out all the blessings that Moses granted to each of the individual tribes and is thereby spared the need to compose a new blessing for Simeon, for Shimon, or to note the absence of one. And now I want to take us to, I think, a really critical passage uh, in the book of Kings that really outlines, perhaps better than any other single passage, the problematic nature of the tribes in scripture that Josephus tries to address. And this is a passage that takes us to the aftermath of the kingdom of Solomon. After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam uh, inherited the throne. But basically, at that point in time, the northern tribes 
they pledge allegiance to Jeroboam, and it's the beginning of the division of the two kingdoms. So I'll just note here uh, in the middle of this passage, there was no one, this is uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, you see, there was no one who followed the house of David, that is David, Solomon, Rehoboam, except the tribe of Judah alone. When Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin to fight against the house of Israel, against the northern kingdom to restore his kingdom. So you see there, there's a real sort of fault line in the text. We have one verse that tells us there was no one who followed the house of David except the tribe of Judah alone. But then when Rehoboam comes to Jerusalem, he assembles all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. It's quite a fascinating, again, fault line or tension in the text. When we come, if we take a look at that, uh, the Septuagint translation, look what the Septuagint does. The Septuagint translator or translators, they noted that there was a problem there. And so they, they correct it. They fix it. The, the, one, the, the first verse says, none followed the house of David except the tribe of Judah and Benjamin only. And so then you no longer have a contradiction with the subsequent verse. But we then, but in the Septuagint, this is really sort of a one-off. It's the only place where the Septuagint seems to be sensitive or concerned about this issue. When we come to Josephus in his retelling, look what he does. He, he reverses the order. Although the tribes of Judah and Benjamin elected Rehoboam king, the rest of the populace revolted against the descendants of David. And so then Rehoboam, as Josephus called him, assembled the two tribes which remained subject to him. So in, Josephus, in a way, flips around, the, flips around the passage to, as it were, emphasize that, yes, Judah and Benjamin were, with, uh, were in the south. And... He goes on, in fact, on occasion after occasion to make this point. In my county, no less than nine occasions does he refer specifically, explicitly to 10 tribes in the north, six times to their southern counterparts. On none of these occasions does the Septuagint refer to them or the original Hebrew version of scripture as preserved in the Masoretic text that we have today. In other words, as I said before, Josephus is really concerned to systematize the history, the story of these tribes. I want to give a few other examples, really two other main examples of how Josephus deals with, with the tribes. Here we come to the uh, second book of Chronicles, and we're in the reign of uh, Hezekiah, whose reign may have overlapped with the period in which the northern kingdom fell, but it certainly followed uh, the time in which the northern kingdom fell. And when we look at this passage, I'm not going to read it all, but this passage clearly takes place, is clearly set after the fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians. And in this context, Hezekiah is trying actually to expand his realm from the south into some of the territory that had previously belonged to the north, and is trying, as it were, to make contact to some of the tribes, to some of the peoples who had been part of the northern kingdom, and to sort of bring them back into his fold. I'm not concerned with the historicity of uh, what Chronicles reports Hezekiah is doing. That's not really the issue. What I'm interested in is seeing and noting how, has it, how Josephus responds to this particular source. So again, it's very clear from, you see from the red highlighted passages that we're dealing here with uh, post-Israelite exile uh, and with the remnant population there. So I'll just read the middle passage. Courtiers went around to throughout the land, basically it was the time of Passover, they wanted to invite these remnant peoples, uh, the remnant population to come to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Uh, and that, so that God may turn again to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. And then at the bottom, you'll see it. There's a hope that even those people, those who the Assyrians had exiled will actually return, uh, will, will come home. Now let's see what Josephus does with this. Josephus is aware, appreciates that there's a problem here, because in the Book of Kings, it's very, it's very strongly suggested that the entirety of the northern kingdom's population had been exiled. In other words, they were all gone. So how can it be that after the Assyrian context, there still you still have tribes, you still have people who are there? And so what he does is he simply flips the chronology of the passage, and he turns this whole episode into something that happens prior to the Assyrian 
destruction of the Northern Kingdom. You see in the passage highlighted red, his, uh, his couriers or these prophets who he sends around exhorted them in, 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 and foretold, they're exhorting the, the population in the North, foretold what they would suffer if they did not alter their course to one of piety toward God. In other words, this was sort of an effort by, uh, by Hezekiah to, you know, to convince the people of the North, the tribes of the Northern Kingdom, to become, uh, you know, to, to follow what God wanted them to follow in order to save themselves. But they were scornful and they didn't take him so seriously. And the result was that a little bit later on, the Northern Kingdom, in fact, fell. So my point is here, we see how Josephus has basically noted a problem in the text, an inconsistency in scripture between Kings and Chronicles, and makes an adjustment that basically, uh, that, that fixes, that solves the problem by, as it were, switching the chronology of the Assyrian destruction of the Northern Kingdom and Hezekiah's appeal to the tribes of the North. And now we come to, I think, really what's the most significant passage uh, in the story of Josephus's interventions, biblical interventions or biblical rewriting vis-a-vis -vis the tribes of Israel. The context here is the book of Ezra. We're in the time of the Persian Empire. Uh, some Jews have already been allowed under Cyrus to go back to, to Judea and to rebuild the temple. And now uh, in this episode, this is in the Bible, it's in Ezra chapter seven, the Persian king Artaxerxes commissions Ezra to basically, uh, to basically become the leader of the Jews who have gone back. And the letter authorizes not only Ezra's authority, but also invites whoever among the Jews in Babylonia who would like uh, can go back and, uh, and join Ezra in Jerusalem. That's basically what uh, Artaxerxes' letter does, according to the book of Ezra. Now let's see what Josephus does with this episode. He writes, when Ezra received this letter from the Persian king, he was overjoyed and began to worship God whom he acknowledged had been the cause of the king's kindness to him, for which reason, he said, he gave all his thanks to God. Then he read the letter in Babylon, where he was living, to the Jews who were there, and, while he kept the letter itself, sent a copy of it to his fellow Jews who were in Medea, sort of a neighboring uh, kingdom. When they learned of the king's orders and of his piety towards God, as well as his goodwill towards Ezra, they were all greatly pleased, and many of them, taking along their possessions also, came to Babylon out of longing to return to Jerusalem. But the Israelite nation as a whole remained in that country. In this way, it has come about that there are two tribes in Asia and Europe subject to the Romans, while until now there have been 10 tribes beyond the Euphrates, an immense multitude whose number, I, my base is blocking there, cannot be counted or something like that, it says, but you can read it, so you'll, you'll be fine. All right, a few observations about this text. First of all, this business of this copy of the letter sent to Medea, this, so far as I can tell, is Josephus's invention. We don't find this in scripture. We don't find this in the Septuagint translation. I am not aware of it existing anywhere else. And then if we try to understand what exactly is happening here, it seems quite strange because it seems like the Jews who were in Babylonian Ezra's time, basically with Ezra, make their way back to the land of Israel. And those are the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, who then in turn get scattered around Asia and Europe, and as it were, are living under Roman rule in the late first century when Josephus is writing this. But the Jews who were in Medea, they make their way to Babylonia and stay there. And that explains why there are the other 10 tribes are to this day beyond the Euphrates and they are an immense multitude, presumably because there are 10 tribes vis-a-vis -vis two tribes. So what's fascinating about this passage is how Josephus basically sets, sets up the division of the two tribes and the 10 tribes in conjunction with the borderline of Roman power. Uh, because at the time that Josephus is writing this, the Euphrates River was not just a great river, it was the major geopolitical boundary in the world. It was the boundary of Roman power. Uh, and 
what I think Josephus is trying to do here, well, first of all, as we've already said, he wants to showcase that all 12 tribes are still in existence. And he wants to also make a point that actually the vast majority of the Jewish people on, as a whole is not actually under Roman power and not under Roman rule, subjugation, perhaps one might say. In other words, and he emphasizes, you know, this notion of an immense multitude whose number cannot be counted, there's almost a hint of a little bit of a political threat or at least political reassurance, let's say, vis-a-vis -vis Jews. In other words, Josephus is saying, look, okay, we're living under Roman rule, the Jews are living under Roman rule, but actually many more of them are, are not, and they could actually be quite a reservoir of power. Now, does he have precise information about this, these numbers? No. Does he have precise evidence that they, in fact, belong to the 10 tribes? No. In all likelihood, they did not. Um, that's not the point. What's interesting is the way that Josephus here tries to, as it were, manipulate. And it's a little bit clumsy how he does it, but nonetheless quite fascinating to manipulate the biblical record, again, to make the claim that the people in its entirety is still in existence, and again, to, to correlate their division with the divide between Rome, the world of Roman power, and the world beyond Roman uh, power. All righty. Um, so I'd like to close, if I don't know if it's okay if I take a few more minutes, I'd like to close with one last uh, passage that takes us in a slightly different direction, but I wanna end with this passage because it, uh, it, takes, us, it takes us back to something that Professor Merget alluded to last week. And I think is really one of the, one of the most remarkable passages in the, in the Jewish antiquities. And it's a, it, it's a nice segue it's nice to follow what we're, we've just looked at with this source, because this source, the source from uh, concerning Ezra, as I suggested, makes a kind of subtle political point about Jewish numbers and Jewish power. And this next source concerned with Daniel uh, does that even somewhat more explicitly. So the context here is the second chapter of the book of Daniel. Tormented by a dream and enraged by the failure of his servants to interpret it for him, King Nebuchadnezzar resolves to put the wise men of his realm to death, including the Judean exile Daniel. But Daniel is endowed by God with knowledge of both the dream and its meaning, thus securing his own survival and that of the others. In his dream, Nebuchadnezzar had seen a humongous statue with a head of gold, breasts and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron, plus feet mixed with iron and clay, into which a stone crashed utterly destroying it, and thereafter becoming a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Daniel interprets the various metals as representing a series of empires, commencing with Nebuchadnezzar's own realm. As for the stone, it stands for the final and eternal kingdom that God himself will establish. All that appears, all that appears in Daniel chapter 2. Josephus, after summarizing Daniel's account as to the succession of empires of gold, silver, and bronze, writes that uh, another uh, power, another government that shall be like unto iron, shall put in, uh, sorry, I'm reading different translation. And this power will be ended by still another, like iron, that will have dominion over everything, owing to its iron nature, which he said is harder than that of gold or silver or bronze. At which point, Josephus breaks off the course of his narrative to comment, and Daniel also revealed to the king the meaning of the stone. But I have not thought it proper to relate this, since I am obliged only to write of what is past and done, and not of what is to be. If, however, there is anyone who has so keen a desire for exact information that he will not stop short of inquiring more closely, but wishes to learn about the secret things that are to come, let him take the trouble to read the book of Daniel, which he will find among the sacred writings. As many commentators have noted, by reporting the destruction of the whole statue, including the iron, by the stone, by, and by announcing a willingness to relate only past and present, and by describing the iron reign in terms that appear to be evocative of Rome, dominion over everything, because uh, Rome was the dominant power in the world, Josephus appears to indicate to Jewish readers, those you know, presumably most likely to be diligent in reading, uh, to take the trouble to read the book of Daniel, 
that one day Rome would fall at the hands of the Messianic kingdom. Now, a few other observations. It's been noted that this is the only place that Josephus makes such a statement concerning the historian and the future. It's the only place where he says that it's not his job as a historian, it's not proper for him as a historian to talk about the future. And it's also been noted that no other historian, no other ancient historian writes such a thing. So I'd like to say about this, that had Josephus not made this point at all, he could have recapitulated Daniel's entire clarification and just left it at that. The reader might have you know, assumed that this had somehow already transpired or was in somehow you know, incorrect or would happen at some point in the very distant future and who knows what its relevance was or would be. But by asserting that he as the historian does not address the future, he is in fact precisely doing so since he thereby indicates that what Daniel had said long ago in the past had not yet transpired. And by referring this to the future, he implies that it you know, will in fact happen. And this, I think, is a wonderful instance of what Professor Merguez referred to last week as Josephus' subtle resistance to Rome. I also want to say about this that one other, two other interesting points, Josephus elides the aspect of the feet mixed with iron and clay. So in, in the original biblical passage, you have the iron legs and then the feet mixed with iron and clay, which in the original book of Daniel are meant to refer actually to the Greek empire that at the time was split into Ptolemaic and Seleucid branches. The fact that Josephus leaves this out, I think renders his, uh, this section all the more striking since a contemporary reader of scripture might have struggled to apply that specific aspect of the prophecy uh, to Rome. But by removing it and emphasizing instead the iron's, the iron's dominion over everything, Josephus in essence bypasses what could have been a problematic passage and referring the, his reader back to scripture solely with regard to that stone that betokens the messianic, the coming messianic kingdom. Finally, so far as I'm aware, this is the only passage in the entire Jewish antiquities in which Josephus explicitly refers the reader back to scripture. The move is all the more striking given Josephus's insistence, as we saw, that he does no more than translate the Hebrew books into the Greek language without adding anything or taking anything away, a claim that he in fact revisits at the very close, uh, close of this section. Asserting in such close proximity that he has both left something out and that he does not leave anything out, I want to suggest that Josephus actually draws the attention of the careful reader to precisely what he has done here. and. It, makes the reader notice it all the more and take it uh, and take it seriously. And in short, Josephus's retelling of Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is an excellent example of the care and subtlety Josephus brings to his rewritten Bible. As to what will in fact happen in the future, I as a historian also cannot say, but except that I do have things to say concerning the future of Josephus's writing, I do have things to say concerning the future that Josephus's writings have experienced these past nearly two millennia. Indeed, that will be our theme next week in the third and final installment of our series. So I very much hope to see some of you then for Who's Josephus? The first century historians after lives among Christians and Jews. All right, well, thank you very much for being here. I hope that uh, this, I gave you some appreciation of the subtlety and, and cleverness and consistency and, and care really with which Josephus revisited the biblical text and along the same lines, the Jewish past. Thank you so much. And now I welcome questions and comments. Yes, indeed. So th thank you, Daniel. This was fascinating. Uh, can you go to the Q&A and take a look? At, can you see what's on at the Q&A and take a look no. at the questions there? Or do you want me to read it for you? Well, here, I think it's good. It's, it's You can good. handle that. Okay, but by way of starting us on this conversation, I would like to pose a, 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 maybe a question that may, that may uh, not go exactly as, as you want us to go, but I would like to go to the beginning of what you said. Yeah. About Moses and truth. Can you tell us a little bit more about how Josephus... I'll put it as a question. Is Josephus a philosopher? Is he telling us something very deep, which I think is very close to what Philo is saying yeah. about Moses? 
and that there is a difference between truth in the biblical text versus history in the biblical text. So how do you relate basically philosophy and history in Josephus's work? Okay, thank you. So I just want to make sure I understand you're asking about the, the relationship or contrast between truth in the biblical text and history in the biblical mm -hmm. text. And where is Moses? Is Moses a philosopher or is Moses a historian? Okay. Where is Moses in that? Okay, well, this is uh, it's a very good question that may have to think about that for a second. Uh, truth in the biblical text, history in the biblical text. Well, I'll start out by revisiting something that I said, um, and I don't mean to cop out, but it just I need to give myself some time to think about it, which is again, I'm not, I'm argue, I, I think I'm trying to argue that Josephus, I see Josephus as really a very careful reader of scripture, uh, who was very much aware of the various problems, uh, inconsistencies and so forth in scripture. And so I don't, when he, in his retellings, I don't think he's simply, I think he's aware of the fact that he, that there are real issues and he is simply trying, it's a kind of, you know, rhetorical technique. He's trying simply to tell the best version of scripture uh, that he can, one that will be of service for his, the particular needs that he faces in addressing the challenges that he faces, as I try to, as I try to suggest in this talk. But that doesn't quite get at what you're saying. You want to know truth in the biblical text, history in the biblical text. I think that uh, I'm hesitant to answer because it's not it's a it's a very important question and one that I'm not sure that I've really thought through enough. But I'll take a stab at it, and I think that I I I, I think that Josephus. I almost feel like in the passage that I that I that I showed for us. Uh, before, where he talks about how Moses's self-understanding, that Josephus is willing to sort of, in a sense, grant that, that uh, you know, to acknowledge that there may not be absolute truth or in a pure, you know, theological, completely theological manner uh, in what, in what Moses, uh, in what Moses said or did or passed down, but that the very ethical quality uh, in which, the ethical character in which Moses did it is suggestive of, really that is the argument for why we should take Moses and the Torah and Judaism seriously. And he actually, he opens the Jewish antiquities as a whole with a similar kind of uh, stance, uh, emphasizing the ethical value of the book in a, in a sort of open-ended way, as if to suggest that it could, you know, uh, that uh, that Moses's teachings really have you know, validity indeed for all humanity. And I think in the passage in against Appian that I showcased, I think there's something of that. There's something of that implied there as well. I'm going to stop there because I don't want to. Okay, I feel a little bit push to the limits of my knowledge, to be honest. Um, Professor Murgay, feel free to chime in. I'm happy to be corrected if, I, if I've gone astray somewhere, so. Uh, Francoise, you want to uh, say something now or take a look at some of the uh, uh, comments? I see people still peep putting things both in the chat and in the Q&A. Let's go to the Q&A first. Okay. And then you can look at the chat if you well, can switch. From Brian Rojas, uh, what, method what, what methodologies can be employed to distinguish authentic historical accounts of Josephus from later editorial changes or manipulations? That's a great question. Um, and uh, I have to thank you for the question. And I have to, and I have to acknowledge that it's, it's a difficult question that you ask for what I have been trying to say, because you raised the question, if I'm understanding your question uh, correctly, well, what about, how do we know that what we're reading in Josephus today is really actually authentically what Josephus wrote? That is to say, you know, we have Latin translation of Josephus. Uh, there've been, you know, there's a whole textual, you know, history of textual transmission of Josephus. How do we know that, how can we be sure that changes haven't been made to the text that have 
that in that have an impact on the kinds of arguments that I'm trying to make. And it's an excellent point. Uh, and we do know, in fact, it's not from Josephus, but I'm aware of an interesting case in my work on the ancient traditions of the Ten Tribes, as you probably noted, that's a topic that interests me quite a lot. There are actually a lot of ancient sources that refer to nine or nine and a half tribes in the Northern Kingdom, precisely because of the point that I made, because historically speaking, it actually seems more likely that there's that there were nine or nine and a half tribes, the half being the portion of Levy that was scattered in the north. And a lot of ancient authors seem to have been aware of that. That's actually sort of the dominant reading that we find in texts from the Second Temple period that refer to the lost tribes. But of course, later on, it comes to be under known, you know, everyone knows that there were 10 tribes in the north. And in fact, we have some instances of manuscripts where you see that a later hand went into the manuscript, crossed out the nine and wrote, you know, a 10 on top of it. So these kinds of editorial manipulations do in fact happen. But so I have to confess that I haven't really done all this work, I have not done this work exhaustively as one would ultimately need to do it for, for Josephus. So I grant you that. Nonetheless, I would be the, the manner in which the consistency and the range of places in which Josephus, you know, in the text that we have really is you know very consistent and careful about this point i mean it would have to it would imply just a drastic degree of later editorial manipulation uh to correct for all these things and furthermore i would say that the passage that we looked at toward the end where josephus i think josephus makes this whole case about 10 tribes being you know east of the euphrates or past euphrates two tribes in the in the Roman world, that's, it really makes sense. What he's doing really makes sense for his time. If a later editor, editor or you know, someone wanted to sort of correct something about the tribes, I don't know, it just, uh, that source, it feels, it, it very much suits the immediate period in which Josephus is, is writing. So I, I can't exclude what you the possibility to that you imply, but it seems unlikely to me. It seems that barring real concrete evidence that there was later manipulation, I think it's most likely that it was Josephus. And if there was later manipulation, well, then there was probably it looks like there was one hand that really went through and made all these changes. And so then it's, you know, pseudo Josephus is the rewriting of, of the Bible with regard to the tribes. But I think it's probably Josephus. I hope that's uh, at least a, a good initial stab at an answer. Thank you for the question. David Goldstein, how closely does the version of the Torah that Josephus referenced compare to the version of the Torah that we have today? Do Josephus's Hebrew records indicate any major differences? Ah, that's a great question. That also, honestly, you, it exceeds my knowledge. I, I, I will state at the outset. But we do know Josephus indicates that he was, you know, that he was aware of and using the Septuagint text. Uh, but having grown up in Judea, he would have you know, likely had had encounters, you know, have familiarity with at least whatever version of the Hebrew text was around at the time. I'm trying to think, uh, and I actually think in the in the case that I that I that I highlighted from the first book of Kings, chapter 12, that was the passage with the accession to the throne of Rehoboam, where we have this fault line in the text between only Judah being in the south or Judah and Benjamin being in the south. I honestly think my understanding of what happened there is that this whoever prepared the Septuagint translation was just going through the Hebrew text that they had, um, which is still the Hebrew text that we have, and basically said, oh, that's weird. There's a contradiction there. Um, this doesn't make sense. Okay, I'm going to make this one little change in the previous verse. So they both say Judah and Benjamin. Okay, problem solved. I keep going on. I think that Josephus my suspicion is that he had access to the Hebrew text and the Greek text and was actually sort of looking at them, comparing them, and saw that the Septuagint uh, change solved the immediate textual problem, but that similar problems were, you know, throughout the text and therefore undertakes a much more comprehensive revision. We do know that he reports that Titus, I believe, gave him a scroll of the... Uh, uh, he requested holy scrolls from Titus and got them. Uh, and, you know, there was a large community. I mean, there, there would have been copies of uh, 
of scripture in Greek in Rome at that time. I mean, we know there was a large Jewish community. They were mostly Greek and, and Latin speaking. If you visit the catacombs from that period of time, you hardly see any Hebrew in the, among the Jewish uh, uh, graves. You see Greek and Latin. Um, so I, I think it stands to reason that he would have had access uh, to both. And actually, it's sort of in his account of the triumph in Rome that Titus celebrated upon the defeat of the Jerusalem destruction of the temple, it's very curious to me. He describes all the, you know, all the great floats that depicted scenes from the battles. And then he depicts, he reports how the various, all the, the goods that were confiscated from the temple, the menorah and various other sacred implements were paraded through the streets. And then the very last thing that Josephus mentions is being paraded through Rome was a scroll of the law. And I can't prove it, but I've, I've often just, it's hard for me to believe that that would have been the last thing that the Romans would have uh, paraded in their, in their, in their, in, in their celebration. Um, and, and it's, I, I've often wondered if Josephus doesn't just sort of stick that in because he wants to grant the law a sort of a, a place of pride in the, in the, in the Roman the triumph. It's his sort of little sort of his little editorial manipulation, let's say, when he describes the Roman triumph, my hunch, which of course I can't prove, doesn't really answer your question. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm happy to invite uh, Professor Murgay if she has thoughts on this uh, question to to respond. Uh, do you have something you'd like to say? Um, from from the passages that I have closely examined, it is. Josephus follows the Greek text. So when you look at the details, um, the details reflect his use of the Greek rather than the Hebrew, which doesn't mean that he doesn't have the Hebrew as well, as as Daniel, as you said. Um, but in general, he you know, in case of divergences between the two, he follows the Greek. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, I mean, that certainly applies to the set, to the passage that I looked at, though, yeah, um, from 1 Kings. All right, let's see, other questions. Uh, here, Mason Marks, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, this man, do you think he may have been worried of consequences from the Roman Empire in sharing a prophecy that claims that empire will fall? Yeah, I mean, this came up a little bit last uh, last week. Yeah, I mean... I think that's the generally the the sense about the Daniel passage that uh, that Josephus forbears spelling it out explicitly, precisely out of a sense that it wouldn't be so prudent to reveal when he's writing under Roman rule and living in Rome uh, that there's a prophecy that the uh, uh, that the that the that the empire will fall. Um, not that Romans necessarily would have would have uh, would have believed it, but it obviously wouldn't have pleased them to hear that in the Jewish scriptures there is there is such a prophecy. Uh, so yeah, that's I think that's that's a major reason why why he leaves it out. But just what I tried to bring out is just I think it's quite fascinating all the steps, all the things that he does and all the and all the things that he says that draw attention to the fact that he that he left it out. Um, uh, let's see. I'm not gonna I apologize. Look me up some other time. We can talk about Dante's view of Jews. I just, I have a very, my brain is like a file cabinet. So right now I have my Josephus <laughs> file opened as, to the extent that I can open it. Um, and I, I'll need to close that one to open something else. Sorry, I'm more of a filing cabinet than a computer, I guess, in that respect. So I apologize, but thank you for your understanding. And uh, is there anything else? I don't. Yeah, know if there I, I would like one one more question, which is really fascinating to me. The way all the information you shared with us, all the texts you chose, are basically historiographical texts. So he's retelling a historical narrative, mm -hmm. but that's not exegesis. Mm -hmm. So can you give us, for example, uh, other other texts? let's say from Genesis, for example, that he will do exegetical work and Midrashic work mm -hmm. uh, and how different or similar it is to what he's doing in his historiography. Mm. Okay. Oh boy. I'm trying to, trying to think. Um, 
And I'll say, if I don't have an answer for that right now, if something doesn't come up and maybe Francoise has something to say on that, I'll try to have something, yeah. try to have something to offer at next week's lecture. Um, I, I can jump but, in. Yeah, yeah um, please. And actually it was, it's kind of also, it dovetails with my own question. I couldn't post it through the Q&A, I posted it through the, through the chat. Um, so, so it's also interesting. So I'm gonna give one example that, um, also shows how Josephus um, interpretation exegesis sometimes echoes rabbinic interpretation. So to show also the the the, the parallelisms there and the dialogue that 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 may have existed. So this is about uh, Moses' childhood in Egypt, and um, so Josephus adds. Uh, a passage where the daughter of Pharaoh, which gets a name in Josephus, she's called Termutis, mm -hmm. um, holds baby Moses and present, presents him to her father, Pharaoh, and expresses to, to him her desire to adopt the baby mm -hmm. and to make him into the her of Pharaoh's kingdom in case she wouldn't um, bear any children. Mm -hmm. And um, Pharaoh then, in Josephus' version, so takes the baby into his arms and he puts his own diadem, his own crown on the head of the baby. Mm -hmm. And um, Moses, baby Moses throws the, the crown and um, to, to the ground and trample, tramples it with his feet. Mm -hmm. And um, both um, Pharaoh is unwilling to intervene and the daughter said, oh, it's just because it's a baby and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So the, the first interest of that scene is that so kind of a little exegesis, a little addition by Josephus to show that there were, I mean, that there were early signs there of um, Josephus uh, of Moses, sorry, um, taking, you know, the, the, the potential threat of Moses to the, to, to the Egyptian power. And um, the, the other interest of the scene is that there are also Midrashic traditions that have a very similar story. Mm -hmm. Instead that in those stories, Moses is actually seizing the crown of Pharaoh and putting it into his own head. So we see that Josephus kind of finds a middle way there. I mean, if he indeed knew those traditions and that those traditions, but that, that because the, the, the version that we have in rabbinic tradition is much later, but if indeed those traditions already existed in the first century, and we don't know in which in which shape, but and if Josephus knew them, then he also made them much milder, saying mm -hmm. that Pharaoh himself placed the crown upon ba baby Moses' head. Mm -hmm. So that um, kind of softening the, the image of, of Moses. Mm -hmm. so anyway, this is just, just a little example there. Thank you for, uh, for saving me there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a great answer. Mm. All right. Let's see. Do we have other comments in the uh, chat that we that you would like to respond to? There are more Let's about see. the tribes. Oh. The comment oh, from on. Noreen Cohen. Yeah. Hold on. Let's see. Okay. I'm getting to that. Uh... Hold on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, actually, if it was, you want to read it to me, I'm not sure. Um, okay, there is uh, okay, there are several people in the chat. So one, let me start with the one. Okay, the 10 tribes in the north include the two tribes that made up Joseph. Yes, yes, sorry. That's yeah. what you the mentioned. Yeah, they, yeah they, so they, then the conclusion is that there were three in Judea. So that's, in a sense, yeah. also an issue that you raised. Originally, except that, that the tribe of Simon, Simeon, seems to... Sort of fade away basically so in the end you really only have two in in judea uh unless you count the levites who were there but in theory were also you know in the north uh 
Hence, we sometimes see, as I alluded to before, sometimes in the Second Temple literature, the references to nine and a half tribes or two and a half and two and a half tribes. But sometimes you see nine and three actually also, the three again being presumably Judah, Benjamin and, and Levi. So Mark is going to make a connection between Josephus and the Guide of the Perplex, which is kind of along the lines that I had in mind since I'm teaching the guide to more as a matter oh, of fact. Okay. So he says the following, um, per, uh, chapter three, paragraph 28 of the Guide of the Perplex, uh, there are two different kinds of beliefs in the Torah. There are true beliefs and what makes them true mm -hmm. Uh, what uh, I, I yeah, and what makes them true is that they are true, mm -hmm. and then there are necessary beliefs. That's true. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's exactly how Maimonides classifies it. There are necessary beliefs which we do not measure by their degree of truth, but mm -hmm. by now they are. But by how beneficial they are, that they are beneficial when many people believe in them. That's exactly yeah. what Maimonides is saying. So the belief that God gets angry and punishes the wicked isn't a true belief, according to the Rambam, but it's a necessary belief. Right. If many people believe that God gets angry at thieves and will punish them, then we need less police. So and so, so you get what what uh, he's saying. Yeah. So I guess the the question is: Josephus makes the same move or not? He's not yeah. posing the question. I'm posing it. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think he, I certainly think he thinks he has some kind of conception of, you know, I have to be careful here because I, again, I, I don't feel, I don't feel that I'm enough of a specialist to really, in Josephus to, I, I want I don't want, I want to be careful about saying what I think Josephus actually says. I mean, this is something I, I'd love to have an answer. I think what he's at least at, at least in the passage that I showed, he's presenting a version of, of the necessary belief and showing that Moses, I think he wants you to show that Moses had a deeper sense of that than, than other lawgivers uh, did. Or at least that there was, that in the case of Moses, it was not about his own personal aggrandizement. It was rather about what he thought would be good for himself as a human being and what he thought would be good for his the Israelites as human beings and potentially also what he thought would be good for all of humanity uh, as, as human beings, um, as opposed to just thinking that by ascribing his legislation to a deity, would, people would you know believe it regardless of what its character was or um, you know that, that way he could get people to listen to him. So... I, I want to hold off there. I don't know to what degree did Josephus distinguish between necessary truths and and, and actual truth. I, I'm not sure how much I, how I guess what I'm saying is I'm not sure how much Josephus is a is a philosopher actually, especially given that I think there are some echoes of Philo in a lot of what he says on these fronts. That it could be that he is just he's gotten these things from other places, likes them, feels that they're helpful for for his particular purpose. I don't exclude. Uh, I don't exclude it. I mean, I think. From what the, the places in the passages in Josephus that I've looked at very carefully, I'm very impressed by the degree of care to which he and thought that goes into them. But i just how much I want to make the case for Josephus as a philosopher. Now I have to be very cautious about that. All right. So uh, I think that would uh, whet our appetite for next week, right? That when we continue to think about the reception of, of Josephus and um, how he was preserved since his writing in Greek. How was he preserved for Jews who are not going to be able to read in the Greek yeah. text? So we Why are not? going to talk about the Yosipon, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's really interesting who really cares about Josephus and at what time and which aspects yeah. of the Sifrit uh, really speaks to either Jews or non-Jews yeah. at the given And time. what counts as real Josephus, as the authentic Josephus? For who and at what point in time. We'll okay. address those points next week. Yes. That's for next week. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening.